We called him our mayor for four years. He's now back, along with his wife, at a tell-all book. They're with us this half hour. Plus, we take you into and under what Union Station claims is the most Instagrammable moment of the year. And, of course, we lift up the hood on some of the week's most impactful local news headlines in our reporter roundtable. Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marley Scorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. With so much fixation on the ongoing mayor's race in Kansas City, it's sometimes good to take a break. This week we do with a man who knows all too well the promise and pitfalls of being mayor of Kansas City. Kansas Cityans know how to roll up their shirt sleeves and get to work. They want a mayor who will do the same thing. I'm a former auditor and a finance professor. As the global economy continues to falter, who else is more qualified to lead this city? You elected him mayor in 2007. Mark Funkhauser is with us. He's now publisher of Governing Magazine in Washington, D.C., the go-to publication for tracking trends in local and state government. And with him is former First Lady Gloria Squitero, who is back in town with a brand new book, part of a new memoir series chronicling their relationship, the campaign, and their time in office. When you see, though, that old campaign commercial, does that make you feel, ah, oh, wistful of those times, or do you still feel some pain and angst and turmoil about those days, Gloria? Both, absolutely, but mostly seeing that commercial, I forgot about that commercial. It was so good. That was after we finally got some money rolling into the campaign <laughs> and, could, and can have something professional done. You know, I was looking through the book, and it is an amazing book. It's called May Cause Drowsiness and Blurred Vision. I'm not talking about the blurred vision, because to me there was a lot of eye-popping uh, aspects to this book that I loved, including the back cover that says they can throw her out, but they can't sh uh, shut her up. She has the rare distinction of being the only first lady in America legally banned from City Hall. That's a great seduction to get you into this book. Um, so do you feel differently about that today than you did then, and do you better understand uh, why that happened? why getting banned happened um i understand with my head like but not with my heart um with my head i understand that it was about money and and power and funk was shaking that money and power up and i was an easy target um but yeah i would still today do it all over again because i don't think a lot of people get an opportunity to do a whole lot of good for a whole lot of people. And that was a wonderful opportunity. In the book you say in 2011, Funk was blacklisted in Kansas City after the election and were forced to leave the home where we raised our children and, more, uh, and, and then moved to Washington, D.C. Did you feel you had a choice after losing that election, which is really now eight years ago this very month? Uh, uh, no, I, I mean, uh, blacklisted? I couldn't find a job here. Absolutely, uh, the kind you know, and I had thought that I would. Uh, well, you had several jobs, and then they disappeared. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, people, and so, so yeah. I mean, I had to leave, and 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 I was very uh, fortunate uh, to land at governing, and you know, it was it's a national platform to talk about what I want to talk about, and so I'm 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 happy with it. Uh, I was darn upset to lose the re-election. Uh, and, you know, looking at that campaign commercial, I'm reminded of how much fun the campaign was. Being mayor was hard work, and the campaign was hard work, but it was fun. You say in the book that uh, you knew very little about politics, cared very little about politics, but you thought your husband was going to make a, quote, kick-ass mayor. Did you yeah. think he was a kick-ass mayor? I think he... He accomplished what he set out to accomplish. His biggest goals, saving the city financially, reducing the crime. I think he did a fantastic job. Had he listened to me and my Italian roots, what my <laughs> intuition was telling me, that he needed to fight fire with fire, hire Steve Glorioso, he wouldn't listen. Everybody thinks Funk listens to my every, every word. So this guy doesn't listen to nothing. And I think had we hired Steve Glorioso and gotten in the mud the way 
you know, the rest were getting in the mud, I think Funk would have still been mayor. Would you have changed anything, man? Oh, I think she's right. I don't know whether Steve was the right person, but, but I yeah. had hired um, good people who I knew and who I liked, none of whom had experience with really cutthroat politics. And that's what the mayor's office is in Kansas City. And really, I, from my you know, vantage point in governing, it's true everywhere. Um, and so Gloria always uh, you know, points out to me how often in our 40 years or so together that I've said, well, yeah, you were right. And yes, she was right about that. You have in the book here, it is my calling, Gloria, to make every husband on earth feel grateful they're not married to me. Yes. So you appreciate the fact that you might not always be the easiest person. I am so not easy. The <laughs> only reason I'm with this guy is because he's the only one that thinks he found a prize in me. Now, when I, I spoke to some of your advisors who had worked very closely with your administration after your election, and when you lost that election, what, what was the greatest accomplishment? They, at that time, said it was you removing the metal plates from all of the roads all over Kansas City. Do you view that as your biggest accomplishment? Well, I took a picture yesterday of metal plates on the road here. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, they're back. Um, but... If you take a look at the uh, 2019 budget for the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and their business plan for the city, and they've got a, 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 an elaborate, nice business plan, five-year plan, all the policies that we were able to put in place that were not in place when I took office, that we were able to put in place are there now and they're working. My fingerprints are all over the financial pic picture. Uh, there, uh, when, when Kay Barnes was in office. She had tripled the city's debt load from 500 million to a billion and a half. Uh, we held the, the line on debt. Uh, she left a fund balance of about 10 cents. Uh, th today, the fund balance is 17%. That's really good. That's really strong. Every former mayor of Kansas City now has something named after them. Kay Barnes has the ballroom <laughs> at the convention center. Emmanuel Cleaver, his boulevard. Charlie Wheeler, the downtown uh, airport. Dick Berkeley, the park by the riverfront. Yet nothing was named for you. Does that stick in your craw today? Well, that was the plan. Kansas City is run by the BS party, the build <laughs> okay. something party. Everybody, you know, we don't need to build. We need good financial management. We need to focus on crime, those sorts of things. The everyday life for the people who live here. Does that bother you, Gloria? Uh, there is one thing <laughs> named after him, and it's because I forced it. Um, it's a little plaque over on the east side that I demanded his name be put on there. There were council member names there, but no mayor. Um, so he's got one, but no, Funk was not in it, you know, for the glory of the mayor title. You know, he wasn't in it for to be a cheerleader for the city. He was in it to fix the city, and I think he did a really great job of fixing the city. Now, we are in the middle of a major mayoral campaign, and people are getting fed up of it, hearing about it every single week on this program. Yeah. But Jody Justice and Quinton Lucas, have, have one of them will have one foot in the door that you held for so long. Um, what advice do you give them uh, as they enter City Hall? Well, I don't know anything about politics normally. I was only, you know, aware because of funk. And I don't know about local politics here enough to say anything. Uh, so I don't know if they're part of the establishment, not part of the establishment. But if they weren't part of the establishment, like Funk, well, Jolie Justice is, but I don't know Quentin Lucas. But if he's not part of the establishment, if, if he's populist like Funk was, he needs to play it really smart when all that negativity comes through and, and be smart about that. You can't wear the white hat in your first term. You can wear the white hat in your second term. Do you have that in the book? Politics is ugly, especially if you're the guy wearing the white hat. So she believes you were the guy wearing the white hat. What advice do you give to Jolie Justice and Quinton Lucas? Well, uh, one of the, th I mean, I was, despite the fact that I worked directly for elected officials for almost 30 years, and I thought I knew the game, yeah. I was naive. I had no idea how mean and vicious and nasty it is. And so my first piece of advice is take care of the people that you're close to. You know, a whole lot of mayors and governors and folks like that wind up uh, destroying their relationship with their children, with their spouse. 
Uh, and you, when when the substance hits a fan, you know, pay attention to the people you love. That's that's the first thing. The second thing is, there will be a recession in the new mayor's term. I mean, there's no question about it, and that's going to be tough. Uh, and so, you know, I would I would say focus on the finances and get ready. Are you happier today than you were when you were mayor? Oh yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, no, you, you're not. disputing that. No, that was he loved doing that. It, it, it was hard. The, the mayor's thing is all consuming all the time. It's in your face. And it was the hardest thing we've ever done. But he's always happy. He don't look happy. Look at him. <laughs> like he's the same as he was eight years ago. I said that he looks the same. He has the same demeanor. But he's. he's Stern and unyielding looking, but he's actually a very happy man. Why wouldn't How he? about you? Uh, Are you happier now than you were then? You know what? Um, I am so much stronger mm -hmm. now than I was then, and I'm really grateful for that. And I'm really grateful for Kansas City for making me a strong woman, because I think we need strong women today, now well, the, more than ever. The book is called May Cause Drowsiness and Blurred Vision. You can join the mayor and former First Lady Gloria Squitero at Barnes & Noble at Town Center Plaza in Leewood from 1 to 4 this Saturday. They'll also be hosting a book launch party at 7 at the Westport Flea Market. Details of both events at Gloria's website, GloriaSquitero.com. Former Kansas City, Missouri Mayor Mark Funkhauser and former First Lady Gloria Squitero. Thank you for joining us on Week in Review. Thank, thank you. you. You're always so nice. Well, thank you. Our reporter roundtable straight ahead, but first, it's opening weekend for what Union Station is calling the most Instagrammable moment of the entire year. We're talking about the largest aerial art installation in Kansas City history, designed by trendy LA artist Patrick Sheehan. To prove to you I actually do have legs under the desk, we decided to take out our cameras and experience it for ourselves. Our tour guide is the head of Union Station, George Costello. So this is what you're calling the most Instagrammable moment in Kansas City for the entire 2019, John? What'd you say? This is Kansas City's largest outdoor air art installation ever. How does this actually work? Or does a magician never reveal his secrets? This is one of the most complicated art and science installations you will have seen in Kansas City. You'll see these giant pylons that we've had to install to protect all these special cables. And there are 78,000 pieces of hand-sewn mylar above us. And it changes colors. So whenever you're here, there's a different color. There's a different emotion. Yeah. On cloudy days, it looks like a thunderstorm or the ocean. What One bit fell off. I, pay, I thought it was a piece of trash, but I have a piece here probably valued at like probably $30,000 yeah. in my hands. And Patrick will be here Saturday night, so get him to sign Is it. Is he really? And boom, you get to put it on the KCPT auction. No, because you have the big event on Saturday yeah. where you're going to be having food and entertainment. People are going to be able to see this for the first time. What happens after that? Can you come over here at any point and see it for totally free? Totally free for the entire summer. Oh, it's really rising there now. Go and see. People will just go crazy. I'm going to try and get it. Yeah, well, you're okay. healthy. If all I right. did it, I'd bring it. You, you want? Okay. Hey, one, two, three, you can do it together. Yeah. Honor it. Okay, all, all right. right. You can still purchase tickets for the opening night experience with live entertainment, exotic bites, and limited soft and not-so-soft drinks. Details at the Union Station website. After Saturday, head there for free with your picnic blanket. It's going to be there until Labor Day. Now, with the rest of the week's news from 41 Action News reporter Kat Reed and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. Missouri making national news this week as it prepares to join the state of Alabama in enacting one of the country's strictest abortion laws. Missouri poised to ban abortion at 8 weeks. No exceptions are provided for rape or incest. I believe that all life is sacred, and so we need to protect that life. Well, I believe it is the will of the people. It is essentially a total ban on abortion. To present it as anything other than that is really just misleading and insincere. Some say this is about provoking a legal case that will prompt the Supreme Court to rule on abortion. Advocates hope a more conservative bench will overturn Roe v. Wade. Is that what this is about, or is there more to it than that, Kat? Well, I think all of these cases are designed to trigger a court challenge. I will say that the Missouri bill has some things that I think make it a little bit um, better in case there is a court challenge, if people are wanting to keep some of these things in. It has different tiered provisions where if 
eight weeks is knocked out, we go to this many weeks. So I think that it has some more protections than the other bills. I will say I think I'm uniquely qualified to talk about this since I moved from Alabama to Missouri. So it's interesting to see them both in the spotlight this week. The Speaker of the House says this has absolutely nothing to do with legal cases. I mean, this is designed to withstand any legal scrutiny, Dave. Well, regardless of what the Speaker or anyone says, it will be challenged in court, as will the uh, uh, statutes in other states that are passing these restrictions on abortion. And clearly the idea is get this to the U.S. Supreme Court. I'm fascinated by the idea, and I don't, I haven't been able to find the answer yet as to why this uh, statute in Missouri is not being challenged in state court, which is exactly what happened in Kansas, and the Kansas Supreme Court found a fundamental right to abortion in the Kansas Constitution, making the state in some ways immune from whatever the Supreme Court decides on Roe v. Wade. And that tactic, for whatever reason, hasn't been tried in Missouri, and I'm not sure why that is. Perhaps there are some abortion rights groups that are uh, pondering that now. But the courts are where this will be decided, not necessarily in the legislatures. We know the 2020 race for the White House has already begun. Is the race for Congress in Kansas also now underway? This week, the Kansas City Star reports that Sam Brownback's former campaign manager has been meeting with the National Republican Congressional Committee about a possible run against Sharice Davids. Amanda Adkins is a vice president at Cerner. Also meeting with top GOP leaders in Washington, the former head of the National Down Syndrome Society, Sarah Hart Weir, who lives in Johnson County. So Republicans believe they need a woman to pick off Sharice Davids a year from now? Okay. Well, I think those are a couple of options. We could see some more people come out of the woodwork, but right now it does appear their top two people coming forward could be women to challenge her. Yeah, it, just quickly, uh, the women, suburban women voters are the key demographic that have, uh, has deserted Donald Trump and to some degree the Republican Party, and I think Republicans think in districts like the 3rd District, they clearly think they need or may need a woman to challenge Sharice Davids. And Republicans already uh, ratcheting up the attacks on Davids with the National Republican Congressional Committee claiming Davids is endorsing murder after wearing this t-shirt. Take a look at this with the caption, all my heroes killed colonizers. Is this a minor spat that will go away by next week or something that will linger on for Davids? I think it's a minor spat that will probably blow over. I think that the bigger criticism she has to face moving forward is the criticism on the left that maybe she's not doing enough endorsing Medicare for all. Um, but other than that, and she, she, of course, will face criticism from the right. I think the T-shirt is going to blow but up. But I love reading the comments of these stories because I saw one that said if, if she was wearing that T-shirt before the election, she wouldn't have been elected, Dave. I don't think that's true. I, I agree with Kat completely. It's a minor uh, incident. We live in the outrage society, Nick, when somebody says something, oh, my gosh, oh, the, how could this boy, if this was said in another context, the only person exempt from that is Donald Trump, who says something triply outrageous to that almost on an hourly basis. So I think it'll blow over. More forums in the KC mayor's race this week. But are we really learning anything new about these two council members and attorneys who want to be our next mayor camp? You know, I think from the first one, we did learn some new things because we got to see them together, just two instead of 11, to see kind of how they position themselves against each other. It was interesting to see Councilwoman Justice really, in that first debate, take some steps in distancing herself from Mayor Sly James, who's endorsed her uh, on the airport issue. They kind of separated there. And she also really is touting her experience in Jefferson City. We're seeing Councilman Lucas kind of go after that and say, we need experience here, not in Jeff City. So. We're seeing how they interact with each other in terms of policy issues. Not a lot of new information is coming what out. One development this week we saw was the battle of the endorsements. Former mayoral candidate Councilman Jermaine Reed endorsing Jolie Justice. Right. Catherine Shields, a city councilwoman, uh, endorsing Quinton Lucas. Do they cancel each other out, Dave, or well, is one a, better than the other? No, that, I think that that is exactly the point, that they will sort of cancel each other out. Catherine Shields from the 4th District endorsing Quentin Lucas, and then, of course, Jermaine Reed, Lucas's colleague in the 3rd District, endorsing Jolie Justice. Remember, Jermaine Reed and Jolie Justice served together on the Aviation Committee, the airport committee that chose 
uh, Edgemore as the developer for the airport, so there's some personal connection there, and there's always been a bit of friction, as there typically is, between Reed and Lucas because they both re represent the 3rd District. Catherine Shields has been a critic of uh, Troy Schulte, the city manager. She's been a sharp critic of the lack of affordable housing, incentives for some projects. She's right in the pocket of where Quentin Lucas is, uh, uh, you know, addressing the uh, voters of Kansas City. And by the way, uh, both of them were also critical of the airport process at some point. So there's sort of a natural alliance for the two of them there. Just very quickly, they are making some news in the debates. The first two that I moderated, uh, sponsored by the Star, both said they would vote against incentives for this new luxury hotel that's proposed near the Performing Arts Center. That, if Jolie Justice and Quentin Lucas are not on board, that thing is dead in the water. And then both said at the second debate we sponsored in the third district, they would endorse a tenant bill of rights, which may be a big issue for whoever the next mayor is and next council in terms of renters and the number of renters and the ability to be evicted or not evicted. At one point, Jolie Justice suggested, Nick, that free legal services be provided to anyone facing eviction, so that's interesting as well. It, when J Jermaine Reed uh, put out his press release saying he was endorsing Jolie Justice, he said that uh, we need somebody who was not going to pretend to have fixes and solutions to our city's problems. Was that a, a fatal body blow to Quinton <laughs> Lucas? Certainly not a fatal blow, but I think that was a very pointed comment, and it's no surprise there has been friction between them, and especially over the airport process. So I wasn't surprised to see that endorsement come out. I don't know how much of a difference it will actually make. Now, for all the attention being paid to the Kansas City Mayor's race, what about our other Kansas City Mayor, David Alvey, this week, delivering his State of the County address in Wyandotte County? You know, you can bring all the development. You know, the Legends is great. Fairfax is great. Um, you know, Amazon, those are all good things. But if it doesn't help improve the quality of life for the people who live here, there's really no point in doing it. Why is it we hear so much about Sly James and these candidates wanting to succeed him and so little about our other Kansas City mayor, Cat Reed? Well, I think one reflection is because of how many people he represents, but I also think in the past uh, year, really, the people making headlines in KCK are more often the DA and the chief of police, especially with the KBI investigation. So I think that those leaders have taken sent center stage on that side. How is he doing as mayor of Kansas City? It's been a long time since we've talked about right, this. Right, I think his marks are relatively high. Um, I do think that there will continue to be in Kansas City, Kansas, some, again, friction between City Hall and the fire service and overtime hours and substitution, which was an issue in the mayor's race. And while you're right, we don't pay a lot of attention now. We have paid, we did pay some attention, Nick, as you know, to the actual race with Mark Holland because that got a little nasty at the end. Um, but Kansas City, Kansas, as I was talking to Kat earlier, uh, reminds me a little bit of independence, you know, a, a, a big city, but, but sometimes overshadowed by, uh, overshadowed by the bigger cities, and that's why you don't see it in the news quite as much. We did hear from our viewer David in Merriam who asks, whatever happened to Alvey's predecessor, Mark Holland, do we know? We interviewed him, I think, last month uh, about the debate within the Methodist Church. He is being a reverend, a minister full-time right now. Well, you might have seen flags at half-staff throughout the Metro this week as the nation marks National Police Week, a time to honor officers who have died in the line of duty. But remarkably, more of our police officers are dying by suicide than are killed in service. The Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, no exception. They've lost four officers to suicide in the last four years, and this week, Police Chief Rick Smith says they need help. He says the Los Angeles Police Department has 17 psychiatrists on staff. Kansas City has none. Are the candidates for mayor falling over themselves to help make that happen? Okay. You know, I haven't heard that come up a lot in their platforms. They talk a lot about wanting to have social workers to respond. So a lot of resources for the community. They've said they want resources to support law enforcement, but this specific topic um, I don't believe has come up, Dave. Right, and I think the push is to get federal funding for this. And I do believe Josh Hawley, Senator Hawley, is involved. And I also believe that the bill passed the Senate I believe in the last right. 24 hours or so. So that's good news. I will say that the chief wrote an op-ed for the Star about this problem, and he, you know, it obviously needs to be addressed. But he claimed in the op-ed that he doesn't have the money to pay for this, which is just not true. He just, you know, there's it's a quarter billion dollar budget in the police department. You could get rid of the horses, 
and you'd have plenty of money for a psychiatrist. No, so I, I went out not advocating not this on right, KCBT, right. ladies and gentlemen. I know that Nick Haynes is not in support of that. I just report I don't want the protesters news. outside of <laughs> This Sunday, the Country Club Plaza, <laughs> losing its movie theater, a Cinemark announces it's closing after 20 years in the shopping district. Every time a store leaves the plaza, there's alarm that this is the beginning of the end. But with upscale Nordstrom heading there shortly, right next to Cinemark, uh, is there cause con for concern? Is there still lots of life on the plaza, Kat? There's lots of life on the plaza. I mean, it'll take a little while for Nordstrom to get there, but I think once it's there, that that'll spur a lot of development on the plaza, new stores coming in. It is my neighborhood movie theater, and so I, on a selfish personal note, was sad to see but it But they are go. promising a more upscale movie theater to try and come in there soon, so that, that's some yeah, optimism. But movie theaters everywhere are a tough business. You can watch movies at home, st on streaming services, and the plaza, as we've talked about, Nick, a lot, the nature of the plaza is changing. Uh, you know, retail is changing and, and restaurant experiences. So, uh, you know, this turnover is not a huge surprise. Now, speaking of closures, try to drive by the Nelson Atkins Museum this week and you'll be met with road closed signs. Gillam Road shut down for its new walking wall project. It's amazing. In all of the news accounts I could put my hands on, no one was expressing outrage that their commutes were being inconvenienced for the sake of art. One woman claiming this is just one month of disruption. Potholes have disrupted our drive for four to five months. So no one cares that a public street is closed for an artist's wall cat. You know, our station is nearby and I haven't even heard the photographers complaining about not being able to drive that way. There's an appreciation for public art in Kansas City. There's no denying that, especially if you live near the Nelson, exactly close to right. it and have to take that way. I mean, but my commute is being inconvenienced, Dave. Well, I, I would take it up with City Hall, Nick, when, you know, they, they perhaps they could address it with you. But I think Kat's exactly right. That neighborhood particularly is used to things like shuttlecocks and walls across streets and new buildings. I don't think it's a big income. All righty, from 41 Action News, Kat Reed, thank you so much for joining us. To connect the dots on the news of the week, Dave Helling of your Kansas City Star, thank you. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.